Well, uh, philosophers, just as anybody else, need promises, and for sure, metaphysics is not any kind of a promise, as Kit Fine has pointed out. It holds out, as he says, the promise of presenting us with a worldview. However, promises are only food for thought, and unless they accept from the start, as Barry Strout has recently argued, that engagement and metaphysical dissatisfaction are one and the same, Philosophers, just as anybody else, also need plain food. In particular, they want to be able to answer such acute challenges as those raised by relativisms and idealisms of all stripes, which constitute a permanent threat to our genuine grasp of the world. As is well known, such as the integration challenge which any rational being has to face, whenever he wishes to clarify the link there is between the ways in which we come to know the truth of such and such domain and the way in which our beliefs hook onto the facts of such and such domain and may then be entitled to be taken as proper knowledge claims. Well, in what follows, I'd like to make some suggestions in order to fill the gap which may thus appear between our epistemology and our <coughs> metaphysics. Viewing things mainly from the metaphysical side of the challenge today, I'd like to suggest that even if the path to be followed is rather narrow, since it has to avoid both false modesty or even cowardness, and temerity or arrogance, it's indeed not only legitimate but necessary, in so doing to follow a deliberately metaphysical stance, along dispositional realistic lines. In so doing, I hope to suggest some reasons to prefer a boldness to humility in our metaphysical claims, namely in our claims to a genuine knowledge of things, of their real <coughs> nature and of properties. No doubt humility in metaphysics has for it a long and rich history or simply good taste when one considers all the various neo-Kantian relativistic anti-realistic and anti-essentialist arguments that have been put forward no later than a few minutes ago. Humility had its days of glory, in particular with the empiricists, Hume, but also more than what is often thought, John Locke, and also, of course, with the Kantians and contemporary Neo-Kantians. We cannot go further than the ideas that are derived from our sensible impressions, such as the empiricist and skeptical motto, or our knowledge is situated within the limits of any possible experience and mere phenomena in the Kantian version. In both cases, the very nature of things is forbidden to us, both in terms of our access to it and in terms of its contents. Thus, it is impossible to answer the integration challenge if one stays on the level of mere epistemology we also have to determine what we know, when and if we know something. From such a viewpoint, Keynesians and Humeans are on the same boat. What we come to know are not the things in themselves, their intrinsic properties, but mere phenomenal appearances, either because of the receptivity of our sensibility or due to the limitations of our cognitive faculties. We cannot get out of the constraining frames of representation. Whoever would dream of natures of substantial forms or forever fixed essences would live in the wrong century. When viewed through the prism of relativism, such a humility takes the following well-known form. Even if all things are not totally construed or made up, what we deal with are, at best, family resemblances and games which allow us in such a continuum of floating and vague identities, all in all, to cope with the world as much as we can. How could we possibly and seriously intend to explain things, or even more, to have the ambition to erect a system, the story goes, when we're only facing analogies, shadows, bits of things, which, through the game of associations, we can indeed appreciate, combine, or even identify, but for sure cannot approach except through our descriptions, stories, fictions, and tales. We shall never know the heart, and even less the cement of things, at best, when the tale is being told by science, as some philosophers of science tell us, what we have some access to is some sort of veiled reality. Well, we know how it is a widely shared view 
to represent the world as a set of atomic entities with a space-time location endowed with irreducible fundamental properties, such a universe made of solitary mosaics peopled with individuals or substances which are characterized by their intrinsic properties may be, of course, traced back to Aristotle. However, at his time, we were still dealing with a world constituted by dynamical substantial forms. Through the Siva mechanism, the model has tended to become more and more barren. We are now left with a world of passive entities, merely linked through contingent relations, and all this, in modern times, contributed to deepen the gap between epistemology and metaphysics, and to induce, in the end, such forms as those illustrated by Kantian humility or human skepticism. Thus, it's not surprising that those who, in contemporary metaphysics, rather favor powers and capacities, take as their favorite, as a favorite target, as much as Kant's model, Hume's model, in the guises it has taken in David Lewis's approach. Well, indeed, there's not a long way to go from Kantian humility to Lewisian humility, as has been pointed out. Let us recall what is at the heart of the first one, Kantian humility, an acute awareness either of two classes of things, phenomena which are knowable, and <coughs> things in themselves which are unknowable or of two forms of epistemic excess, according to which the only possible excess is constituted by an empirical relation of affection through appearances, as has been well documented by Ray Langton, then by Hannah Whittle, and by David Lewis himself. But also along the lines of a more realistic reading of Kant, as the one proposed by Ray Langton, we find that the root of such a Kantian humility the recognition of two classes of properties of things, the relational ones, irreducible to their relata, contrary to what a Leibniz might have thought, which we can know, and the intrinsic ones, the knowledge of which is forbidden to, to us. Well, in that respect, Kant's epistemic humility would be, to a certain extent, moderate. Our knowledge is constrained by your limited accessibility, while ignoring the nature of substances and of their intrinsic properties, we know that there are independent substances thanks to their relational properties. We know that there are independent uh, substances thanks to these properties which do affect us. Hence, Kentian epistemic humility would have a wider scope, in fact. First of all, since sensible receptivity is largely admitted, Secondly, since there are many philosophers who, even when they consider that relational properties, and in particular causal powers, melt into or supervene on intrinsic properties, find that such a connection is contingent and that it doesn't provide any large knowledge whatsoever of intrinsic properties. Take, for example, Frank Jackson's words in From Metaphysics to Ethics. I quote, when physicists tell us about the properties that take to be fundamental, they tell us what these properties do. This is no accident. We know about what things are like, essentially through the way they impinge on us and our measuring instruments. It doesn't follow from this that the fundamental properties of current physics or of completed physics are causal cum relational ones. It may be that our terms for the fundamental properties pick out the properties they do via the causal relations the properties enter into but that at least some of the properties so picked out are intrinsic. They have, as we might put it, relational names, but intrinsic essences. However, he does suggest, and so Jackson concludes, the uncomfortable idea that, they may, that we may know next to nothing about the intrinsic nature of the world. We know only its causal cum relational nature, end of quote. Well, clearly, it's neither idealism nor relativism here which lead Jackson to such a conclusion. Rather, it is a certain conception of the links between relational and intrinsic properties. And this is also what leads Lewis to humility. If one thing is the basis, another one the causal power, and if the link between the two of them is contingent, then indeed we don't have access to the intrinsic properties. We face as something we know not what, and we can only identify the properties through the role they occupy. This is what Langton and Whittle both concludes. 
So Lewis doesn't seem to be moved by such a thing. However, is he right? Well, on the epistemic level, maybe he is, since he takes the fundamental properties to be simple, not complex entities, or again, structural properties, namely properties composed of other properties, of which it is impossible, more or less, to say much more. So in a way, as Stadis said a few minutes ago, explanations have to stop somewhere. If we were to reach the bedrock of fundamental properties, we would have reached the final end of scientific explanation, as Lewis writes in his late paper, Ramsey and Humility. Optimists, says Lewis, hope and expect that we will discover the final theory someday soon, or anyway someday. I share the hope and expectation, but I'm not assuming it. Maybe scientific research may go out of fashion Maybe the task of fully understanding the workings of nature is just too hard for us. Right? Now, as everybody familiar with Lewis's epistemology knows, it is implied by the final scientific theory that the universe should not be an indefinitely complex location. Otherwise, science would never be completed. No doubt, then, some kind of humility is up to the point, since we could never reach a complete knowledge of the properties. However, this would, this would not be because of the intrinsic nature of the properties, which we can never, in principle, discover. Rather, it would be because, as far as we might go in scientific reasoning, we could only reach structural properties which we would have to analyze further on ad infinitum. Since Lewis doesn't grant such a hypothesis, he has to admit that the fundamental properties do not have a complex nature and are symbol. Well, let us note, incidentally, that the properties might have a complex causal nature because of the nexus of complex powers which they endow the particulars they instantiate with. However, as Lewis admits, the human principle of quiddityism he cannot accept such a hypothesis, since the property which realizes a certain nomological role can realize different roles according to the possible worlds. The causal features of a property cannot be part of its intrinsic nature, as rightly pointed out by Anne Whittle. So it may well be the case that we do not know such a simple, analyzable nature for the fundamental properties, which would be identifiable in this world and in other possible worlds. However, we have the means to describe them through the nomological roles, and this is something that Anna Sofia in a way said, uh, which they occupy. In that respect, such an ignorance as nothing dramatic. David Armstrong has a very similar reasoning when he says that the fundamental universal is the internal nature or quiddity, which we would simply think in terms of numerical identity and difference. Well, let us grant all this. Even if we do, it's not sure, though, that we can have the same evaluation when it comes to what is the case in terms of the metaphysical consequences. Let us assume, indeed, as a primitive fact, I don't know what a primitive fact amounts to, but let's subsume <laughs> it. Such a human universe of intrinsic physical properties, contingently, although regularly distributed along space-time points, as described by Helen in her 2006 paper, <coughs> does anything hold the universe together? And in some other guises this very afternoon. How then, if there is nothing more in the nature of such properties, which are nonetheless supposed to serve as a basis of supervenience, can we explain their having so different nomological roles? Is it not surprising that such properties, in their intrinsic nature, in their identity, should have no causal bearing on what they do? And more generally, a fortiori, if they are taken as such entities as are assumed by science, on what takes place in the world. Properties are supposed to have a functional role which allows them to contribute to the causal nexus as a whole. But how should we understand the relationship between the intrinsic nature of a property and its functional aspect? It may be the case that the laws of nature are called in to serve as an answer. However, if such laws are mere regularities included within some Lewisian best system, well, then the natures may combine with very different functional roles. 
Uh, then, to use Sarah's terms, the intrinsic natures of properties seem to be as just substitu substitutable the one to the other as pennies, whatever the context may be. In that respect, incidentally, Armstrong is in a better position with his views of laws as a relation of necessitation between universals. In case of permutation of properties, law will, laws will also have to be changed, as well as the relations of necessitation between properties. It's only under such conditions that one will have the same intrinsic natures with different functional roles. The natures no longer appear as epiphenomenal, but it's just as hard to see how they explain what the nomological relations consist in. The laws still seem to be mysteriously imposed on them. So human metaphysics claims to be an empiricist one and to reject any kind of entities that mightn't be within reach of scientific characterization. Yet it looks as if it does generate the greatest amount of mysteries. Sorry, <laughs> that is. If rationality is something we are aiming at, then we have to make another choice, it seems to me. So this is why I suggest to follow another route basically along dispositional and realistic lines, which have detailed in particular in Le Ciment des Choses, the main characteristics of which might be thus summarized in a nutshell. First, I suggest to adopt a scholastic dispositional realism based on the view that there are indeed real universals, mainly understood not as platonic, mind-independent, uninstantiated universals, such as is the... Um, fictional uh, view still held by some people, um, which amounts to mere metaphysical realism, it seems to me, but rather along Aristotelian or more precisely scotistic lines. The real is mainly defined not as mind independent, but as what signifies something real. Secondly, this goes together with the semantic realism according to which one has first to clarify the meaning of all our concepts, in particular the concept of, cons of causation. We also have to determine the meaning of our dispositional attributions to understand, for example, why reducing dispositional attributions to conditionals doesn't work and why reduction sentences <laughs> cannot tell everything that is meant by our dispositional predicates. Thirdly, it goes together with a scientific dispositional realism which aims at finding real properties and not mere predicates. Fourthly, a dispositional realism which assumes scientific realism as an abductive hypothesis called for by the explanatory necessity of science and assumes certain real universals. Fifthly, a scientific dispositional realism which is essentialist although non-substantialist, namely, which calls for a new definition of essence, maybe a thinner one, I'm going to explain this a little bit more, close in many respects to a form of relational or structural realism, but calling rather for a redefinition both of essence, viewed not so much as a static quiditus or pure natural kind or mere bundle of habits, than as a habit dispositional aliquid and of laws. The main idea is that dispositions find their intelligibility in the conditional necessity of laws. In terms, laws are a, true, are a true description of the world only insofar as they are grounded in what things can do or rather would do in the sense of real metaphysical possibilia which are necessary although discovered a posteriori. Right. Well, since I have not much time to develop all points and would like to leave time for the discussion, I shall just concentrate on, on what I know is the most debatable aspect of my view, namely the fifth one. So, whoever wishes to defend some form of dispositional realism will have to stick, in my view, to four main assumptions. First, a causal theory of properties. Second, a conditional dispositional account of laws. Third, some kind of aliquidityism or thin essentialism. Fourth, take care not only of efficient causation, but of other, maybe teleological aspects of causation. First, let me, let me notice that in order to have a satisfying worldview, I think we are entitled to expect from metaphysics, and even 
if some properties are more interesting to study than others, a metaphysical examination of the whole furniture of the world. In other words, if we are to defend some form of full-blooded dispositional realism, we must at some point take a stand not only on sparse properties, but on abundant properties too. After all, there might be a sense, as Gilbert Ryle was particularly aware of, in examining not merely the natural of physical dispositions, but the whole range of them. And as a consequence, there might be a sense in defending and convincing dispositional realism as regards moral or even aesthetic properties. Secondly, to come to the real meat. Well, granted that we must admit some real generals interpreted along scotistic rather than platonistic lines. How might such real generals really signify something real? My contention is that in order to be clear about this, we have to be clear about the fundamentum of the dispositional realities we've put forward, and to, the hand, to that hand, have to favor some form of, or other of dispositional thin essentialism. What do I mean by this? Well, first, if we conceive such essentialism merely as a natural methodological strategy, or because as George Molnar, for example, claims anti-essentialism sounds so counterintuitive, well, I think we merely go half of the way. On the other hand, if we adopt such a view as Brian Ellis's uh, scientific essentialism, for instance, it may well turn out also that we do not get exactly what we are looking for. Not so much because Ellis's position, despite its great merits, relies on a rather obscure notion of essence, nor for the reason advocated by Manfred that it remains possible to accept natural kinds into one's ontology without accepting the corresponding essences, as because the concept of essence Ellis relies on are more to do, as Alice Drury convincingly argued, with issues related to necessity than with what one might expect from a genuine definition of essence and cannot in particular be used to ground what Ellis claims it does, namely the necessity of the laws of nature, even if they are a prior or a posterior noble doesn't change for me the, the matter, right? Okay. Indeed, it seems to me, as Ellis uh, said, that we should obviously distinguish um, what Ellis and many contemporary uh, metaphysicians and essentialists do not between first definition, F is a necessary property of, of A, if and only if A has F in all possible words that include A. Definition two, F is an essential property of A, if and only if being F is constitutive of the identity of A. For the same and other reasons, the natural necessities introduced by Stephen Mumford to ground the, his lawless realism do not give exactly what we need in order to identify the essentially dispositional nature of our properties. To say nothing of the fact that it is doubtful that causal powers should by themselves be sufficient and could dispense us with laws. We do need laws, and even more, if some or other kind of dispositional essentialism is right, most probably, at least for some of them, necessary, not contingent, laws of nature. In particular, it seems to me that Bird is right in his objections to Mumford's criticisms of laws, according to which laws should be understood as governing rather than descriptive laws, and second, that science doesn't have a really unified concept of law, so that for Mumford we could just as well give it up too. In that respect, Bird's essential or relational dispositionalism is more congenial to the kind of dispositional realism I would like to defend, all the more so as Bird is inclined to consider structural properties as being fundamentally relational, Thus, in perfect convergence with, and this seems to me quite important for a metaphysician, in perfect convention with what science tends to show. And it may well be the case that, contrary to what is most often assumed today, essentialism should develop along relational lines rather than in the wake of substantialist models more in keeping with traditional Aristotelian logic than with what contemporary logic has taught us by insisting in particular on the importance of relations and at all events on the limits encountered by any simple subject, subject attribute conception. 
Well, to make myself clearer, it might be worth taking a closer look into what some scholastics, and especially the Scotists, had to say about essence, what they, they meant also by quiditism and exeitism. Well, first of all, it's important to remember that Duns Scotus did not defend any kind of essentialism, and in particular, it was somewhat different from Aristotle's approach. Indeed, let's remember the position developed by Avicenna and then followed by Scotus, which consisted in insisting on the neutrality or irreducible and positive indeterminacy of what he called the common nature. Crucial to Avicenna's position was the view not so much that essence as such could be considered unto, under two headings, in things and in the intellect, as the fact that it could be viewed as such in its pure essentiality, neither universal nor singular. The essence, or in Avicenna's or Scotus's terms, the common nature, was characterized by such neutrality or indifference to any further possible determinations. For Scotus, there are formal or metaphysical realities which, not, which are not to be viewed, as we call today, primitive thisness, precisely because they are, so to speak, awaiting further both physical and logical determination. The point is less to insist on the necessity to think of essence independently of its properties which belong to it properly, namely in distinguishing uh, the essence from what makes it a particular substance, than to show how what is more an aliquid as a quiditus or a substratum without substance, to use uh, Arda Denkel's nice expression, is necessary in order then to found on the logical level, logical universality, and on the physical level, the quiddity of things. So to be a realist doesn't mean to hypostize Platonic essences, nor develop a form of essentialism simply devoid of the Aristotelian substantialist paraphernalia. It is first and foremost to admit, in distinguishing logical reality and real community, the irreducibility of a common nature which is in itself neither universal nor singular, although it is universal in the mind and singular in the things outside the mind. Second remark, I know that quiditism is not a very attractive position to hold nowadays. As John Hawthorne has noted, for causal structuralists in particular, quiditism with their rough analogues in debates about which charities, where radical charitism is usually taken as a view according to which all the qualities of a particular are contingent to it, only its exchange is essential. Well, quiddities are a will of the wisp, or a way to say that I could have been a post egg, no matter so long as my charity was present. But there is a confusion here, it seems to me, or even a full misunderstanding of what for the scholastics quiddity and exchange meant precisely. Contrary to the view we now have of exchangeism, exchangeism was introduced by Scotus precisely to differentiate formally the singular from the universal or the common nature. Again, in order to be clear about the various categories that populate the world, we should be careful not to confuse the logical, the physical, and the metaphysical levels of our investigation, but also to establish the right alphabet of being. And it may turn out that there are more than one or two kinds of essential properties, in particular, as far as the latter point is concerned, it's important to realize that even as both Scotus and someone like later on the chemist and logician Charles Peirce, who is a close follower of Scotus, for example, argues, even if material essences are dispositional, it doesn't necessarily follow, however, that all dispositional properties are essential. The fact that X is hard needs not be essential to X, even though hardness is a dispositional property causing X to behave in certain predictable ways. More specifically, it may well be the case that we might identify the real nature of a thing, the essential meaning of the concept of that thing, with the complete set of habits that govern its behavior, 
thus no longer distinguishing between the essence and the accidents of the things. But then in order to have a well-realized essentialist world and not a mere mosaic or, of essences or mere mereological sums of essences, are they viewed as static quiddities or as mere natural kinds or as bundles of habits fixed by some mysterious glue as Peirce tried to build in a consistent way out of the scotistic model, one should be able to account for the real binding between the various essences. If in the end all properties are essentially defined as dispositional, namely as entirely reducible to sums of causal powers, how are such powers in turn supposed to be linked together? And again, how are they supposed to be really causal? It may well be that in order to account for this, something more is needed than first, mere natural kinds, second, mere efficient causation. Let me elaborate this a little more. Indeed, if we only have natural kinds and not essences, then it becomes very hard to understand what is the real source of the intelligibility of a thing. Now, the purpose of the quiddity is precisely to specify for any given object the kind of thing it is. The very meaning of a word or significant object ought to be, per se, the very essence of reality, of what it signifies. Now, has he himself claimed against the two static view of essence as defined by Scotus, it's not the behavior of a thing, but rather its habit of behavior that constitutes the intelligible nature or real essence. Such a habit is a general disposition affecting the way that an object would tend to behave under certain types of circumstances. Proust as well as Scotus distinguish so between the essence and the activities of a thing. But although Scotus and the medieval logicians were able to deal with propositions that involved monadic predicates like blank is hard, they were unable to deal with those that involved relational predicates, such as blank as the lover of blank, or blank gave blank to blank, right? Hence, they were able to ask about specific classes or collections of things, each class being comprised of all the subjects bearing a particular monadic predicate. And this also allowed them to say something about the, the relation of similarity, namely the sharing of a common nature that exists between the members of a given class, but useful up to a certain point. This type of logical analysis simply doesn't go far enough. As Peirce showed, for example, in his logic of relations, we wish to analyze relationships other than that of resemblance of a certain object to the various members of its class. It's much more important to make out the way in which laws govern the interactions between objects within a meaningful process. The analysis of such a process or system for Peirce involved the use of dyadic and triadic predicates. To claim, for example, that X is hard is to do more than simply ascribe a particular quality. Um, rather, it is to assert that under certain specifiable conditions, X will tend to behave in a certain specifiable manner. Thus, hardness is to be regarded as a dispositional property, and a real habit or law must govern the behavior of those objects within which it inheres. So any monadic predicate is a sort of generate relative. If we want to make sense of a universe in which there are not mere simple qualities or pure possibilities, firstnesses in person's jargon, or mere actualized possibilities in terms of individual events or mere existential reactions, secondness, we have to proceed that way. In a universe manifesting only firstness and secondness, namely devoid of generality and thus of intelligibility, it might be appropriate to speak of such non-relational monadic predicates. However, as a matter of fact, even one, when one is confronted with nothing more than the case of an individual object enduring through time. Real continuity is involved and the properties that inhere in such an object are themselves general. Hence, the relationships between the thing and its properties can only be defined by a real habit, what he calls a would-be, operating within the actual world of objects and events. 
So what is important is not so much to specify the generality that characterizes a collection of um, objects having some quality in common, what Scotus does, but to account for the infinite number of real possibilia, namely the real and continuous relationship that exists between any two members of a class, between an object and its successive actualizations in time, between the interacting fragments of a system. X gives Y to Z is general, not simply because the relational predicate blank gives blank to blank can be applied to many different sets of ordered triads, but rather because it ranges over the members of any given triad. Here, Peirce's concern is with a type of relationship that is very different from the sameness that defines the medieval general and species. The interest in classes of givers, gifts, and recipients here has been superseded by an interest in the system that encompasses the giver, the gift, and the recipient, and in the laws or habits of behavior that govern their interaction. In all types of relationships, however, even in relationships of resemblance, a real continuity exists between realia, and predicates must be universalized or projected in order to range over the infinite numbers of possibilities. Proust, incidentally, following Francis Habert, is clearly arguing not only that there are real relations, but that relations comprise the real natures of things. Habits accounts for an object's essential intelligibility. Habits are laws that govern objects by relating certain types of behavior to specific kinds of circumstances. Consequently, the essence of a thing is defined not by any particular relationship or activity within which the thing actually participates, but by a general habit that determines those relations and activities to which, given the appropriate conditions, that thing would be disposed. So such a habit is not simply essential to, but rather must be of the essence of the thing, namely it must be predicated of the thing as the medieval said per se primo modo. Third remark, I think we can draw from this an important lesson. If we are looking for the essence of a thing, and if that essence is no collection of properties, but is rather a habit of action, more specifically a bundle of habits or a low cluster, for a low cluster, it may well be that we are going to need more than mere efficient causation in order to account for the way it exerts its causal power <laughs> as a whole. Not only do we have to view the things in terms of a final cause specifying the general pattern of behavior that a given object or organism will tend to manifest, which amounts to saying that what a thing is may be best defined by what that thing is to become, which is a way to say that the causal function of the essences of things may be appropriately defined in terms of both formal and final causation. But we may have to view the binding of all uh, the objects itself, as Peirce and more recently Brian Ellis suggested, in terms of some finer or intentional causation. At all events, this needs to be carefully elaborated, as well as the exact roles played both by dispositions and by laws of nature in the intelligibility of nature. My contention here is that both are required. Dispositions would find their intelligibility in the conditional necessity of laws, but laws would only be a true description of the world, provided they were grounded in what things can do in a dispositional and not merely possibilistic sense. Well, if the fundamental physical properties are categorical and intrinsic, we cannot even know that they are so. In which case, what reason do we have to suppose it? Inversely, if we characterize properties in dispositional terms, then we have a cognitive access to their properties through the effects they produce. If following such philosophers as Shoemaker, Mumford, Bird, or Ellis, we emphasize that properties are dispositions or causal powers, we can show how they produce other properties through the effects they generate and also show how they do it, not regularly, but necessarily, because they are not mere potentialities, but real powers from which laws of nature proceed. 
in some cases necessarily, and not in an artificially imposed manner, could we dream of a better agreement between metaphysics and epistemology? Well, for sure, such a dispositional realist model for properties as the one I have offered is not the only one that can be provided when one wants to reject the neo human model and it has also some common aspects with some kinds of structuralism which prefer a characterization in terms of structures rather than in terms of properties, be they categorical or dispositional, and in particular with some versions of causal structuralism. A few words, so before concluding, to explain to what extent I feel close and yet have reservation towards structuralisms of all sorts. First of all, like structuralism, whatever its variants might be, the scholastic dispositional realism I wish to defend intends to follow the lead of science and the results of contemporary physics, albeit by following some rules of methods, such as the ones that have been suggested in particular by Catherine Hawley in her excellent paper, Science as a Guide to Metaphysics. Hence, it should realize how some hypotheses are hard to sustain as far as such intrinsic properties which would be distrib distributed along space-time points are concerned, or again, as far as separability is concerned. It should take into account some universally admitted facts, such as entanglement, whatever the theories are, general relativity, quantum physics, and the interpretations to which they give rise, possibility of dissolution or state reductions, hidden variables, but just as well, it shouldn't let science dictate everything and become a purely naturalized metaphysics. Hence, to order, in order to defend the, the strength of some metaphysical hypothesis, H, in terms of production and prediction, one can uh, use a status formulation. I quote him, suppose that H together with another set of hypotheses H prime and some auxiliaries A entail a prediction P H indispensably contributes to the generation of P if H prime and A alone cannot yield P. And no other available hypothesis high star, H star, which is consistent with H prime and A, can replace a H without loss in the relevant derivation of P, end of quote. So indeed, the first step for a metaphysician who wanted to oppose the metaphysics apparently embodied in science would then be first to ask whether, and here I, I, I follow uh, Catherine's advice, first to ask whether the scientific theory in question really is empirically successful. Now, scientific realists have noted that the few theories have enjoyed widespread novel empirical success. Two, to argue either that there is disagreement among scientists regarding the status of a theory, or else that there is reason to think that the theory will ultimately be rejected. Three, construct a system of beliefs which includes the traditional metaphysics, but which is empirically equivalent to the scientific system. Fourth, proceed to a strategy of undermining, show that the scientific metaphysics is not involved in generating novel prediction, and thus that its appearance in a scientific theory doesn't give us reading reason to think it is true. Fifth, a science cannot arbitrate, provide reasons to believe that the traditional metaphysics, as opposed to the scientific metaphysics, provided auxiliaries and assumptions is compatible or even superior to the one suggested by a scientific discovery. Have a counter-argument strategy and invoke independent reasons for believing in the traditional metaphysics. In particular, any metaphysician has to measure the importance of coherence, which justifies resorting to interpretation, but also that the special sciences other than physics may realize it in a better way, and that one should try to reconcile the manifest image and the scientific image. In other words, if metaphysics should be bold enough not to fear to be revisionary, it shouldn't be too much revisionary either. It is precisely in that first respect that my dispositional realism separates itself from ontic structural realism. 
which being strength strengthened by an underdetermination of individuality has become, become a kind of metaphysics of fundamental physics, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, and general theory of relativity mainly. Secondly, when pushed too far, structuralism tends to be counterproductive in what it was supposed to be defending. If there is nothing in the world but structure, to what will it be supposed to be opposed as has been pointed out by Psyllus. In general, when one retorted to the term of structure in science, and profitably so, it was because one meant it as an entity with blank places with which objects could occupy. But if these must be reconceptualized or are meant to have a mere heuristic function or even to simply disappear, as French and Ladyman suggest, well, it's hard to understand what role the structure itself can still play. Thirdly, because it was at first conceived along mathematical terms, in French's version in particular, and because one was then eager to erase the lines between mathematics and physics, structuralism lets structure play a double role. But does it really succeed in this, in short, to be abstract enough to be independent of the concrete physical systems, while being in the same time concrete enough to be part of the causal identity of those systems. Finally, and most of all, since dispositional realism also asserts the non-supervenience of relations on the objects, and that objects do not have any existence or identity independently of the relations they have with one another, it's not ready to accept the pure disappearance of the objects, which is advocated by some eliminativist ontic structural realists. Indeed, several reasons, and not only common sense, militate, it seems to me, in favor of maintaining such a category in our ontology. First, a metaphysical reason. First, without relata, relations have no reason of being even if such relata have not necessarily any intrinsic identity. Second, an empirical reason, then. The physical characteristics on which one relies do not, in the least, suggest to abandon such a commitment for objects in the fundamental physical world. Finally, a logical reason, which has to do, as Michael Esfeld and Victor Lamb have mentioned, with quantifying over objects in standard first-order logic, and the apparently unavoidable use of set theoretic concepts and physical theories. If one tries to pull too far the very meaning of our primitive concepts of real and of object, well, then we run the risk of rendering the world simply unintelligible. This has also been pointed out by John Ayle and Peter Anger. Well, as is usually claimed, causal structural realism is in many respects more convincing in particular in its moderate form as the one suggested by Esfeld and Lamb. It has two main virtues. First, because while giving ontological priority to relations, it doesn't deny that properties and objects are part of a fundamental ontology. Simply, as I would claim myself, they do not intend such properties to be intrinsic. They may be relational or extrinsic. If there are physical relations between objects or relata, such objects have themselves relational properties. The universal context of entanglement and non-separability in quantum mechanics is fully admitted. However, a principle of weak discernibility, although much disputes, although much disputes is all, much disputed, is also admitted. Viewed as a symmetric and irreflexive relation between two objects, and there are two objects and not only one, right? Which allows not to take mere numerical diversity as a bare primitive without guaranteeing yet to the objects conditions of identity, hence any real distinction among them. Secondly, it is true that structural realism, whatever its versions are, has a second merit to and adjoin it in that respect, which is to remind us how important it is for properties to have a causal profile. Now, ontic structural realism was aware of the need to introduce some modality within structure, but it failed in trying to do so. It was hard to see whether the type of causation thus introduced applied 
to particular relations or to an underlying causal activity, which, so to speak, would endow the relevant relations <coughs> with causal powers, and if so, how? Hence, as noted by Psilos, it was difficult to choose between the first way leading to a causal structuralism simpliciter and the second one, condemning either to mystery, again, so as to give the needed moral force to the relational structure, or to causal hyperstructuralism, as pointed out by Hawthorne. Causal profiles thus become purely structural, and one ends into a merely formal structure, devoid of any causal profile. In short, one is brought back to one's starting point. In so far as it stresses that properties are well identified through their causal roles, and that the structure are defined as a network of causal relations among properties, hence by the causal powers which they confer to their possessors. Causal structural realism has a twofold merit, which I have underlined myself, to avoid both the circularities and mysteries of ontic structural realism and of Lewisian humility. If all the properties do not have any intrinsic property beyond their causal profile, if all the causal powers are the kind of entities which make things happen, and if knowledge requires some causal contact with the things we know, then our knowledge of properties is, in principle, possible. However, of course, it remains to be shown how it handles a problem which any kind of dispositional monism has to face, which is forced to follow a holistic model. Now, causal structuralism is indeed a structuralism, rejecting any form of quiditism or the view according to which there would be something beyond the causal profile, which independently of it, insofar as it might exist, could make of that property what it is. Well, if no property can be identified unless all the others are, it looks as if none of them can be identified simpliciter. We hope to understand the identity of properties while avoiding unknowable quiddities. We've merely moved the problem to another place, since what we come to is a holistic network of relations among properties which seems even more mysterious and which is not more able to identify the properties. Quiddities have not disappeared, they've become, as Psyllos noted, a global totusity. It's not only the case that our reasons for humility have not been overridden, we should rather say that humility has now turned into temerity. Again, uh, the, there is something preposterous to consider that one can in principle discover what properties are through the effects they produced and that this applies to all the properties. First, because to suppose that the real is knowable, at least in principle, does not imply in my mind that everything in the real, of course, is. There are ultimate facts which anyone, be a man of science or any man in the street, has to take account of. And in particular, such isolated facts as do not imply any explanation whatsoever. Secondly, because one should never underestimate the length, the complexity, and sometimes even the tricks of the various chains through which we come to discover the causal properties, some being too far from one another, some being hidden by the screen, some may constitute. Besides, even granting that the total network of the causal profiles might be knowable, how could we ever know that it is indeed such and such properties that play such and such a role in the totality? Well, finally, what the limitations of causal structural realism show is also, I think, to what extent it is illusory and mistaken to think that one can, in the end, do without quiddityism. In the moderate version, Mikkel Esfeld has come to, he writes that, I quote him, physical structures are networks of qualitative and concrete physical relations between objects which are nothing more than what lie in those relations. In other words, we do not possess any intrinsic identity over the relations in which they are. But it still holds that relations still need relata and that objects are necessary. It's even clearer in the latest version he defends, where he now insists on a simple modal 
or conceptual, though not ontological, distinction between the relations and the objects. However, as I said, I doubt very much that such a concession is enough to provide genuine identity conditions, in particular to distinguish between the essential and the accidental parts of causal powers. As I said, without some kind of aliquidatism, one cannot go all the way down. Since it is impossible, if you want to say what the fundamentum of things consists in, to come to be satisfied with mere modal or conceptual distinctions, even in a Spinozist guise. For you need more than conceptualism to be able to say in what a thing consists in, what its real being is, to talk like John Locke. Such a real being, its identity, is what makes the thing the thing it is. Any radical anti-essentialism would take us to such a global anti-realism that it would surely be incoherent, as I think Jonathan Lowe rightly pointed out. So without a minimal essentialism or a serious essentialism, meaning here not an ersatz essentialism of possible worlds, nor an essentialism of act and potency, but what allows to specify for each object the very being of the reality it signifies, which was Locke's as well as Aristotle's definition, well, I doubt very much that we might intend to not even know, but merely understand what is at the root of the intelligibility of things. This is why, and this is how I would conclude, in relying on a causal and dispositional theory of properties in defending a conditional dispositional account of laws, together with a categoric scholastic realism, which does not exclude retorting to a certain aliquidatism and to another account of causation than the one inhering to mere properties. All in all, a version of what I've tried to present in terms of scholastic dispositional realism seems to be the best way to overcome metaphysical humility and defend a reasoned form of metaphysical boldness, and in so doing against all kinds of Humean, Kantian, and now Straudian skepticism or subtile forms of neo pyrrhonisms favor metaphysical engagement, satisfaction, and optimism.